Welcome. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. On Thursday, January 13th, we are continuing our conversation about the state of our schools, how are our students, our faculty, our staff, and our communities, and what are the things you would like us to do, and what would the things that you would please like us to please not do this year. Um, and I am welcoming first um, Jay Nichols from the Vermont Principals Association. Welcome. Thank you very much, Chair Webb. Good morning, uh, House Education Committee members. Uh, as Chair Webb said, I'm Jay Nichols, Executive Director of the Vermont Principals Association for the record. I'm here to testify today about how schools are doing in relationship to COVID and, and uh, how the year's gone so far. Uh, my testimony is similar to the testimony I gave in October and testimony I recently gave to the Senate with some updates. So uh, first of all, I wanna predicate that my testimony is based on meetings I've had with principals since uh, July, and that's over a hundred uh, principals that I've talked to. So I broke it up into the same buckets, Kate, that you had us do in October. So the first thing is how are the children, staff and families? And I just wanna say, on, and I'll, I'll submit written testimony as well. Children on average, based on principals' comments are struggling. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of issues around self-regulation, um, at all levels, but particularly disturbing in the younger grades, uh, lack of maturity, which all is understandable given the fact that kids have had two years of an unreal experience. Uh, all this makes academic teaching very difficult for teachers, obviously. We need partnership to meet the mental health and social emotional needs of our students. We need to eliminate silos. In, in Vermont, we're very good at creating silos. Uh, we need to get all uh, committees working together, mental health working along with education, DCF working along with mental health to make sure that we're providing all kids with what they need. Um, in my written testimony, I cite three different statements and I give a couple of links. And the big takeaway from that is that the American Academy of Pediatrics has labeled the public health, uh, the mental health crisis, that an actual crisis that is now a national emergency. And three medical groups, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, recently re uh, released a report on that, which I have attached to my written testimony. And then really disturbing to me is that suicide attempts have risen. Uh, the number of ER visits for suspected suicide attempts, for example, by 12 to 17 year old girls, rose by 51% from early 2019 to early 2021. And that's according to the CDC. So that's not, those are national numbers. Um, it's something that we're all very aware of and very, very worried about. In terms of principals, as you know, they're facing unprecedented challenges. Um, the work that they've had to do so far is not sustainable. We're hoping that the changes in contact tracing and some of the responsibilities will make that a little bit easier. Principals are very worried about, is this going to become the new normal? Um, and it's costing me members. We've had four or five principals leave this year in the year. I've never seen that happen before. And we have a bunch that are just saying, I'm hanging on to June, but then I'm probably going to walk away. So I'm, I'm very concerned about that. I know that's true with teachers as well. Families, of course, are all over the place, as you might expect. Um, you've all heard about the issues with masking and anti-vaccine parents um, in board meetings. We've also had some frustration more on a day-to-day -day level related to contact tracing, especially in situations where schools have sent home kids who have no symptoms and appear to be perfectly healthy. Um, and of course, that is now changing with the, with the changes to contact tracing, uh, contact tracing, the lack of a real statewide, comprehensive, cohesive response, and, and maybe a mandate from the state on what this looks like and allowing different schools to have different versions has made it difficult. And again, we are hopeful that the change to contact tracing that was recently announced will make things easier operationally and take some burden off of schools while ensuring probably most importantly, that more students can be at school in person every single day. Um, I already talked about contact tracing in terms of what is working, what is not. There are major staffing shortages, as I know you're aware, few or no substitutes, uh, not just teachers, support staff, bus drivers, paraprofessionals, custodians that are a level worse than ever before in anyone's memory. I recently pinned an op-ed in, in Digger uh, I got quite a bit of response about that, asking people to reach out to volunteer in their schools and help in their schools. And I had a parent reach out to me and say, I tried to reach out to my school and volunteer and I wasn't allowed to because of fingerprinting. Um, and it took so long, I couldn't, couldn't make it work. So even when people want to help and do the right thing, sometimes there's roadblocks that get in the way. 
uh, this shortage is an acute immediate problem and I'm worried about long-term shortages as fewer people are going into education related jobs for a variety of reasons. And that includes teachers and administrators. As you know, there's been issues with transportation, uh, especially in terms of staffing. And in some cases we've had to cancel school because we could not get the kids to school because we couldn't have enough bus drivers. And, and we've had to uh, cancel a lot of extracurricular activities as well. Most principals are not able to serve as instructional leaders this year. Um, the vast majority of the time is spent on management functions and getting things covered. Principals talk about every morning for, for the first hour, hour and a half, they're usually meeting with people to say, all right, who's going to cover a gym today because the gym teacher's got COVID or is out because of contact tracing. What is working, as I mentioned earlier in the year, is that many schools um, have adults that are really bonding together. They're in survival mode, but they're really working hard to support each other and most importantly, supporting all the kids. Um, I do want to mention that the work done in the area of SEL, and I put community schools into that bucket and after school programs and other programs that we do on a day to day basis in schools has been very helpful. I can't imagine where we'd be right now. I can actually because I talked to directors in other states and we're in a lot better shape than a lot of people are. And I want to mention we are not in recovery mode. It's important people realize that we're still in survival mode. And many educators don't feel value. The pension thing last year really hit hard. People are very worried about that. So it's time at, at the legislative level to step up and completely support public education. This means making sure education fund dollars are being used in an effective way. We need to support our public schools and make sure education funds are not siphoned away by any groups or schools that discriminate against some of our children. That's a big issue for all of our groups at Two Prospect. Um, and in terms of requests for legislative action or non-action in 2022, I'd ask you to support the VPA retirement bill concept that allow educators to come out of retirement for one year to fill hard to fill positions. Uh, to me, it's an easy win to win, win, win proposition because they would pay into the retirement system. Support any federal or other efforts that allow for schools to have four-year-olds in school full day for early kindergarten with a corresponding FTE for ed funding purposes. I know that's tied to the president's bill. We hope that sometime that Build Back Better gets across the finish line, especially in terms of early childhood. We are working with our national organizations to try to support that. Uh, look at and support any legislation that will provide financial assistance to educators that work in more economically depressed schools if they did agree to stay in those positions for a set period of time. This could take the form of support and paying off student loans or extra enumeration. It's very hard in our rural schools to keep people. They often have teachers for a couple of years and those teachers leave for higher paying jobs 20 miles further, um, heading back more towards urban, suburban areas. Make sure the state pays for any PCB testing uh, mitigation measures so this doesn't become a budget killer for local school districts. Make sure that any work on Act 173 uh, stays true to the major goals of that legislation. More flexibility for schools to better support students, major reduction in paperwork, focusing on serving kids, and developing comprehensive student support systems. Don't add any legislation that puts more pressure and stress on school boards, superintendents, principals, teachers, and support staff. The list of requirements is constantly growing without the corresponding support. So please don't add, add anything unless you're going to take other things off the plate of educators or you add something new that's going to actually help make it more, uh, make the work more attainable. And lastly, please don't pass any laws that will further increase the divide between the haves and the have nots. We need to make sure our poorest, least resourced school districts have access to high quality, qualified educators, not just the districts with the most resources. There are a couple of bills being contemplated that would, would have an adverse effect on our most vulnerable students in schools. Please look at education related bills in terms of impact on our students, first and foremost. Thank you. And I take any questions and I can stay till 11 to answer questions with the others as well. I have a, a quick question for you. I'm not sure if the bill has come through yet. And Amanda, maybe you could check on that to see if the, the bill that uh, allows teachers to come out of retirement um, has been introduced. Um, and in the meantime, Jay Nichols, who do you think we would need to be hearing from? I'm assuming we need to be hearing from the treasurer's office um, about impact on pension. Yes, yeah. 
but other than that, um, just the usual sub suspects. Yeah, I think so. And I think everybody's certainly in support conceptually of the idea of the devil's office and the details. We need to make sure that if somebody comes out of retirement, they're paying into the system with the new money that they're getting and they're paying into the system at the highest rate, just like they're a new teacher. Right. So we're actually helping the, the pension fund. And at the same time, they're not taking a hit by losing their retirement. And they're filling a position that we're really, that we're not able to fill. Amanda, can you put um, that on our list? I'm going to see if the bill has been introduced or not yet. Um, and uh, we'll, I want to get to that fairly, fairly soon. Um, Representative Austin. Yep. Um, hi, Jay. Just could you be a little bit more specific about the bills that are being proposed that would further divide the haves and half and offs? Well, I want you to look at that lens for every bill, and I'm glad to talk about any of them, but there's one bill right now that's in uh, general military affairs that would allow teachers to essentially become free agents in terms of contracts. And so the way that that bill would work, and I testified against this a couple of years ago, it was uh, put forth by Representative Townsend, if I remember right, and I think it's Representative Townsend again this year. And she's trying to make sure that teachers have more opportunities to leave schools to go for, to other schools for jobs. And I understand where she's coming from. The problem with it is that the way that it's set up is that if I'm a superintendent and, or a principal and we hire a teacher and she signs a contract in April to teach for the following year, she would be able to go right up to the first day of school and interview for other jobs and walk away. And that just leaves our most vulnerable students hanging in the lurch. So if we need to, we can come up with some type of a window that's a hiring season or something along those lines if we have to. What we don't want to have is uh, teachers leaving at the last minute or very, very um, late in the school year and having it be very impossible to find qualified people to take their places in the following school year. So that's one of those bills where people have good intentions um, and they're trying to support the adults, but they're really hurting the kids if they don't really think it through. Thank you. Hey, just let us know what that um, bill number is and we'll keep track. We'll keep an eye on it. Okay. I can, I'll have to email you. I can't remember. I almost feel like it's H80, but I could be wrong. Okay. Uh, Representative Austin, are you at it? I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, Representative Conlon. Thanks. And Kate, you can shut me off if you want to postpone this discussion till the bill actually yeah. comes before us. But in the, in the issue of bringing um, folks out of retirement to work, uh, which seems like a great idea. But I do wonder um, if it's going to run into uh, issues with the NEA, who might fear that uh, school districts would hire somebody coming out of retirement because they don't have to pay um, uh, medical and other benefits necessarily. Let's save that question. I think it's a really good one when we get to the bill. Yeah. Representative Brady. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jay. I just want to ask, when you say, you know, it's time for the legislature to step up and do everything to support schools and teachers, totally agree. Is there anything more specific? It's kind of like parents, I think, wanting to go in and volunteer in schools right now. <laughs> There's not necessarily anything we can do except do no harm. But just want to ask, you know, is there anything else that more specifically we can be doing? <clears throat> Well, I mean, there's some things that we're going to come to you with, but for example, we passed a law last year that said that um, public schools had to follow certain rules for uh, an elementary for exclusionary discipline and private schools didn't have to. We've also passed laws before that has have allowed private schools to receive public funds that discriminate against our kids. Now that's something that hopefully we're all working on together. That's a huge issue for us. Um, and it should be a huge issue for everybody. If public education is a public good being paid for by the public taxpayers, then we need to assure that no students are discriminated against. And that includes religious schools or independent schools. And we've got some great independent schools that do a wonderful job of including all students. Um, and they get public funds. And our argument is that any independent school that gets public funds needs to include all schools, all students in their school. So that's just, that's the overall theme, Representative Brady. And some of that is, I, I believe, uh, some 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 of that was addressed in the 2200 rule, I believe. We're working on the 2200 rule. We have a subcommittee 
Yeah. Um, Sue is on that subcommittee, uh, as am I, um, and Marilyn Mahusky and Mill Moore, a couple other people from independent schools. And I think we're close to some resolution on the 2200 rules. Thank you. Representative Brown. Thank you. Are you hearing, so we heard some testimony yesterday from the Vermont School Nurses Association about the changes that are being made to contact tracing. Are you hearing from your school communities that those adjustments are going to help lighten the burden on school staff in terms of the work that needs to be done around contact tracing? I'm still trying, I think I'm still trying to understand what that shift in workload looks like and if it is going to help. Yeah, I think I testified about that a little bit in this committee the other day, but maybe I was in Senate Ed talking about it. I had trouble remembering. And the answer is um, our executive council talked about it and we're basically going to take a wait and see approach. We're optimistic that it, that it will help. We know that what we were doing before was not sustainable. There was no way. So we're hopeful that it's going to help. There's some fear out there. Will parents be honest? Those types of things that people, you know, we constantly worry about. But whenever I hear Dr. Lee speak, it gives me some hope because he'll say, even if somebody's not doing the right thing, as long as everybody else is masking appropriately, taking mitigation strategies, we're all so much safer. So to, to, to answer your question directly, we're hopeful. Uh, principals are, and the executive council are optimistic. So we'll, we're gonna have to wait and see it plays out. We gotta make sure there's plenty of tasks and there's high quality masks in our schools. And I think if we can do those two things, it can work. Thank you. And um, we are reaching out to the AOE following the testimony we got from the Nurses Association about contact tracing that what we heard yesterday seemed to be in conflict with what the agency had said. So we're reaching out to um, get some clarification from the agency on that. We're also reaching out to get more information on where we stand with masks and, and testing from um, AHS and the AOE. Any other questions for the principals? We can move on to the special ed administrators and welcome Darren McIntyre. Thank you for joining us. And for the record, could you just state your name and position? Sure, thanks Chair Webb and committee members. I'm Darren McIntyre, Executive Director for Vermont Council of Special Ed Administrators. Um, similar to Jay, in, in terms of an update, um, what I submitted was very similar to testimony back in October. Uh, a few updates um, and some others that I'll, I'll share uh, verbally as part of the testimony today. Uh, as many have commented both yesterday and, and even with uh, Jay's testimony, um, we continue to see uh, shortages. Um, our association is tracking those. Uh, we know statewide. Um, I believe there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,300 vacancies uh, across a variety of different positions. Uh, specific to our association, um, I've tracked uh, over 350 uh, vacancies. Uh, those are a combination of special educators, uh, related service providers, so OTs, PTs, SLPs, uh, behavior interventionists, paras, um, school psychologists, um, all contributing uh, to what many have uh, mentioned uh, as a continued crisis with the shortage of staff. Um, most recently, uh, the information that I got from our membership, over um, 30 of our members across uh, 30 supervisory unions, they've averaged the equivalent of 10 full-time equivalent positions or 10 FTEs uh, for vacancies. Uh, that's led to um, continued need for coverage of various roles. Um, as Jay mentioned, you know, while that continues to be a challenge, I think one positive to that is um, it has helped with uh, opportunities for collaborative teaming. And I think uh, when, when Jay talked about some of the silos, <laughs> um, I think there's a greater appreciation in many cases for the duties uh, as others cover. Um, in some cases, general ed for special ed, special ed for general ed. Uh, as Jay mentioned, some of the administrators covering for teaching uh, positions. Um, so I've, I've heard uh, many 
say uh, I have so much more appreciation <laughs> for the role. Um, and hopefully, I, I think Chair Webb, you mentioned yesterday, hopefully once some of this starts to improve, um, we can see uh, opportunities for a reckoning and more collaborative teaming on these items. Um, in addition to the shortages, uh, we've seen um, more recently an increase in special ed referrals. And I think that's um, paired with a number of different items. Uh, as folks have mentioned, um, just a strain on overall uh, mental health uh, needs uh, for students, uh, in addition to staff. Uh, on a student level or seeing increased referrals for that reason. Um, student regression uh, because of continued absences um, uh, that has paired uh, with increased special ed referrals. Um, and I think related to upcoming rule changes in this conversation about delay or implement on July 1, there are several parent advocacy groups um, putting out information to parents and guardians saying, do the referral now to special ed. And if they're not eligible, wait until after July 1 and refer again. <laughs> so that's created sort of increased anxiety and stress um, on an already challenging set of circumstances. Um, wanted to talk in terms of an update on uh, that conversation of uh, the implement or delay. Our association uh, has no formal recommendation. We continue to uh, not have a consensus of, across our membership on that. Um, that said, over 70% of our members uh, continue to stress the need for a delay uh, due to the various circumstances that we're talking about and the effects of the pandemic. Uh, many have stressed agreement with the intent of the law and the policy and want that to be heard uh, to the committee. Um, I, I think that has created sort of a, a level of irony uh, where it's pushed many to say, we believe in the intent of Act 173 so strongly that we wanna do it well. And as a result, feel the needed pressure to delay. Um, and I think Megan talked about many of the advantages and disadvantages of that in her testimony yesterday. Um, and her role um, as the chair of the subcommittee, uh, reviewing some of the, the items related to that. Um, I think paired with what I just said, there's sort of a sense of if it goes into effect July 1, um, we're almost going to see a reverse of the intent of the law with increased special ed referrals, um, an increase in special ed service. And in many cases, uh, you know, we've heard from uh, Jeff and uh, three of the superintendents yesterday in their testimony, we know roughly 50% of the SUs um, under that current um, waiting uh, proposed formula and the finance model, 50% would probably have an advantage financially with that and the others would see a negative impact. Uh, and I think that in itself is also driving this conversation of if it goes into effect, there's roughly five months for guidance from AOE. And we're not, we're not seeing that in many cases. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm grateful and respectful for opportunities to collaborate and provide input from our membership with AOE on establishing uh, expectations for those items. But in many cases, uh, those just are absent and void. And along with the shortages, uh, there's that fear that 
there's just no opportunity for training um, come July 1. So um, that in itself will lead to, again, potentially more referrals, uh, more financial uh, impact uh, of students on IEPs. Um, you know, I guess I would add, in addition to that, we're continuing to collaborate uh, with many of the uh, key stakeholders around um, steps, regardless of whether there is an implementation or delay. Um, so we're trying to work with some of the some of the districts that are further along and MTSS readiness and models for that. Um, we want to be able to. Uh, collaborate and scale those up whenever possible uh, to help with preparation. But again, it's hard to do that if staff are covering um, all their duties uh, and just uh, no capacity for that. Um, Chair Webb mentioned you know, yesterday, uh, many of the special ed directors and LEAs had systems in place. Um, those were canceled. Um, some of the presenters themselves tested positive and weren't able to engage uh, other uh, special education staff, related personnel, um, wouldn't have been able to participate. So just the impact of a presence of staff led to a need to cancel many of the trainings that would have been needed uh, to implement. Um, You know, I think the other is steps to develop ways to mitigate the financial impact. And again, testimony was provided yesterday on advantages, disadvantages. I think that overall our members are saying, you know, we feel fairly confident that there's ways to mitigate over time the financial impact, but the concern is we really need a delay because we can't recover from impact on educators and students' well-being, uh, loss of learning. Um, so um, again, the irony is, I think nobody argues if the implementation is done well with 173 and these upcoming rule changes around adverse effect and SLD identification, then there's going to be greater um, student outcomes, uh, instructional outcomes, well-being, mental health-related outcomes systemic outcomes um, and overall um, measures for tier one uh, instruction and access for all students. Um, but we're asking, I guess, ultimately for ways to support funding. If this is gonna go into effect um, for training uh, some have existing methods through teacher master agreements um, where more formal training is needed um, and credit-based coursework. Others are thinking of using idea B funds uh, to support that and not knowing you know, where things will go with financial impact for those 50 uh, potential supervisor unions that may have as we heard from John Castle in North Country, um, $2 million deficit. Um, I'm not sure where training funds are gonna come from, uh, even if there are staff and, and content available. So support from the committee to find ways to fund financially, uh, the training, mentoring uh, for all the items that we're talking about related to recruitment and retention with the shortage. And then, you know, I heard, again, advantages and disadvantages um, of sort of phasing in potential uh, delays. And I think the biggest impact if we're moving forward with MTSS implementation and Act 173 are the additional rule changes around adverse effect and SLD identification. So if there's a mechanism um, to slow that, <laughs> I think it's gonna compound the ability to do both at the same time. Um, we would ask for considerations to be given around the timing of those. Um, I'll stop there and see if there's questions.
Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you so much for your response on 173. I, I, if I remember correctly, the um, the adverse effect rule goes in July 1. Is that right. right? Yeah. Okay. We might want to talk with you a little more about that another time. Um, okay. Thank you. And we have um, any questions for uh, the special ed administrators at this point? Be time at the end also. Okay, seeing none, Jeff Francis, welcome back. Good morning. Hello, committee. Um, let me start with an, an audio check. Am I coming through okay? You're okay. Okay, if at any point I am not, just signal me and I'll shut off the video. Okay. I do have high speed internet within a mile of the state house, um, but okay. still sometimes experience problems. I'm going to suggest you turn it off now because it's just a little wobbly. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'll turn my camera back on for the questions if you have any. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to start by thanking you for um, your leadership and commitment to delving into this issue. Um, the the challenges that have been brought to Vermont, the world, I guess, the country, and in this case, specifically the education community are formidable. Um, my testimony this morning is going, it's based on a meeting that um, two superintendent leaders, Gene Collins from Rutland Northeast and Libby Bonesteel from Montpelier Roxbury uh, had with the Senate Education Committee yesterday, excuse me, last week. Um, and that testimony was a compilation of thoughts and considerations that we collected from a number of superintendents who serve on the VSA Board of Trustees. And the, the first thing that um, those superintendents spoke about last week, and I'll speak about this morning, uh, is just the high level of anxiety that's been brought to, to the education community by everything that's involved with the navigation of the pandemic. I think that you all are very familiar with that due to um, a combination of your own experiences and what you've heard from others. Um, but we think that the, the nature and impact of the pandemic um, can't really be overstated. Um, in many ways, the anxi anxiety levels are attributable to um, the experiences that people have positionally in terms of their own family, the school systems with it, in which they work, the education system overall. And a lot of it has to do with um, the need to make changes and the communications around those changes. So at the beginning of last week, there was uh, a high level of anxiety um, due to the return from school break. By the end of last week, we had information about the protocol changes that were being announced as we made the shift from Delta implications and impacts to Omicron implications and impacts and everyone knows when we got back um, to work on Monday, there was a tremendous amount of anxiety, a lot of media coverage. Um, and I, in my mind, uh, those manifestations are a product of the, of the navigation um, of the pandemic and, and really can't be attributed to, um, and I'm not saying that anybody's asserting this, but sort of, it's, it, ill will or bad actions on anybody's part. And, and yet there was a lot of energy around, you know, criticisms of the movement forward and so on and so forth. Um, now we're at a point where people have spoken more about the reasoning behind that change. And I think that the change is better understood, but a lot of the anxiety that was with us as a result of the pandemic um, persists. So, the point there is that anxiety levels are high and are going to continue to be high. 
And we've got um, so many people on the front lines of this. Um, you heard from the nurses yesterday, teachers in the classroom, uh, family and children in their homes. Um, so I think that collectively we're all hoping for some relief if Omicron does in fact run its course. Um, but I think that for the time being, the anxiety is with us and that's gonna have profound effects. Um, so that was one theme that uh, we talked about last week and I'm speaking about today. Um, another theme is staffing capacity. And I know that you're fully aware of that. I, I get um, examples every day uh, in communications um, from school systems that either I'm directly the recipient of or that I'm copied on that just talk about the, um, the major implications of um, not enough staff. And as you know, that affects school districts' abilities to remain open um, and just has profound effects uh, in the communities where um, uh, staffing cap capacity uh, results in the, the need to um, close a school or where shortages in staffing capacity cause people to, and this is literal, get no rest. Um, so that's something else that, that um, superintendents are talking about. And uh, when I get to the recommendation section, I'll refer back to, um, it's, it's very, very challenging to um, have immediate solutions to any of these things, but I do think that there can be a planful thought process and there are gonna be lessons learned out of this pandemic for mid and long-term actions that we can take in order to address these issues, um, both in the near immediate future and also over time. Um, student behavior, which is a recurring theme, I think from all the witnesses. Um, and when I say student behavior, um, it's not an assertion that, uh, that it's a responsibility of the students. It, it really goes to um, their own existence within an unstable environment, um, which has been brought to us by the pandemic. And the superintendents who spoke last week in the Senate Education Committee took particular note, and they have uh, firsthand awareness of this and expertise, I do not, that in particular grades, um, it's being noticed more than others. And the grades that they cited were kindergarten, eighth grade, and ninth and 10th grade, where they're seeing um, less stability than in typical years. Um, and in the conveying those thoughts, superintendents indicated that schools don't have the capacity to deal with the dramatic increases in mental health and other behavioral needs. Um, so that plays out um, in a number of ways, including putting more um, pressure on the systems overall, but it should not be lost that the, the pressure that's being felt is being felt by, um, by the students. Um, so what is a very stable construct normally for kids with predictability and so on and so forth, has become less so as a result of the pandemic. Um, thus the emphasis as we work through the COVID navigation that we do everything we can to keep schools open um, in order to provide that um, stability. But of course there's a contest there um, because there's also concerns about the well-being of staff and what they've endured. Um, so there's no real solution here, but it's an observation that's been made in the context of the, the current state of our schools. Um, a point that I made when I testified back in October that's been reiterated is um, one thing that the General Assembly can do is to um, sharpen its awareness with regard to all of these things. And I compliment you for the effort that you're putting into to doing that, um, both um, in the context of yourselves, your communities, the state, the General Assembly overall. But, um, but I, you know, the, the, the request that has been made for no new initiatives that will add burden or complexities is a very serious one. 
Um, I think that that's well understood in this committee. We know that the origins of legislation um, can come from any one of 180 legislators. And to the extent, and you've signaled this this morning, Chair Webb, that the House Education Committee can function as a gatekeeper to make sure that the, that the very well-intended pieces of legislation that could add burden um, may not find their way to um, fruition in this, general, in this legislative session, I, I think is deeply um, appreciated. But as has been alluded to and stated directly by other witnesses, there's a bunch of things going on that need to be tended to that create a, from a public policy standpoint, um, big agenda uh, in the category of unfinished work. You just spent um, 15 minutes talking with Darren about Act 173. We know how complicated that is at this juncture. Um, I know that right this moment, other committees in the state house or the virtual state house are working on the um, important matter of the waiting study, which is a, a, I'd say it's a colossal public policy issue right now. And I spent um, almost two hours yesterday speaking with 40 plus facilities managers, representatives of the Department of Health, of the Agency of Education, and the Department of Environmental Conservation talking about school facilities issues alone. Any one of those main topics could occupy all our time. And here we are treating them as, you know, not ancillary measures, but measures that are taking um, time, even as we contend with all of the factors that that, as I said, have been brought to us by the pandemic that have real um, uh, influence and impact on the ground. Um, so while I'm redundant in these messages, I'm redundant because I don't think that what I'm saying can be stated strongly enough. Um, <clears throat> we were also asked by the Senate Education Committee to talk with them about what we believe the General Assembly can do to be helpful. Um, and as I just completed, first and foremost, we wanna make sure that we have a light year legislatively um, while uh, turning into, I think, the, the responsibilities that are already on the table. Um, we uh, agree with the VPA and others that the legislation that would allow retired educators to augment the education workforce um, should be treated as an imperative. Um, Superintendent Collins, who spoke in the Senate Education Committee last week, talked about the fact that in one classroom, in one grade in her school system, um, they have changed teachers um, three times and they're about to need to change for the fourth. And um, that's attributable to the fact that people currently have limited capacity to work if they're in a retirement status and want, want to come back. Um, I don't know how much that's happening um, from school system to school system across the state, but in terms of the ability to temporarily provide relief to bring stability um, to school systems currently, if we could get a law enacted that would allow folks to um, return to work if they're retired without penalty, we do think that there's promise in terms of greater stability under that approach. Um, I want to compliment the General Assembly um, for the very rapid action that it took around um, procedures for annual um, school district and, and town meetings. So the testimony that I'm referring to right now um, thematically was delivered on the first day of the session. And here we are um, just a little more than a week and a half later. And the, the bill to address town meeting issues, um, it's, it, it's on its way to the um, governor for signature if it hasn't been signed already. Um, in that vein or category, I think you've probably either experienced or read in media accounts that um, there's been a period of time for school board members 
where conducting their meetings has been challenging because of COVID and other factors. I know that there's a bill that's being considered that would allow um, for remote operation of regular school board meetings um, without having to maintain a physical location um, to conduct those meetings entirely virtually. We support that. Um, that also looks like it will be received favorably by the General Assembly. Um, I don't know what the status of that bill is today, but that's something that was cited as being particularly useful. Um, in terms of um, the worker shortage, and this is a longer term need, um, we think a focus on, um, and I know your committee has discussed it, what measures can be taken to induce more stability in the delivery system by having more people interested in serving in public education would also be helpful. Um, and then finally, in terms of the testimony that was offered last week, um, thematically, there was a big emphasis on mental health supports for children. And um, to the extent that there's an ability to focus on how we can enhance mental health supports for children, both through the public education system and through designated agency and other measures, um, that's a need that is likely to persist um, for quite some time. So from a system standpoint, and I know that you've focused on this in the past and are focused on it currently, but that is really a necessary um, body of work. Um, I'm gonna wrap up here in a second and I'll answer questions, but I wanted to um, respond to the questions that were um, are being uh, considered right now with regard to the, the changes in protocols with take home um, testing um, as opposed to contact tracing and uh, test to say um, initiatives in schools, the, the, the current transition as it were. And um, like the VPA, superintendents are um, eager to see all the guidance with respect to that transition. Um, I've heard uh, Commissioner Levine and Secretary French talk about the rationale um, and, and also um, Dr. Lee about the rationale for the change. Um, the rationale makes sense. Um, I think that there is a, um, the most important element of that transition other than the logistics is communicating um, the you know the 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 reasons why and how it will occur um uh but i our association does um rely on the experts in the public health field we support those um and logistically the, the changes that are made are being are being played out in public schools um necessarily and Schools have really risen to the occasion. They're being asked to rise to the occasion one more time. So communicating the how and the why is extraordinarily important. And I would add just one point that I think is probably familiar to the committee. Um, you know, what we heard when we learned of that guidance was that there may be some uh, de-emphasis on staff within schools in terms of their ability to um, obtain tests themselves and participating test, testing um, uh, uh, initiatives. And what was referenced by um, superintendents is the fact that we need to make sure that we've got stability in the workforce by making sure that they are as well situated and I don't know any other term to use than comfortable as possible. And that means that even through the shifts that are gonna take place operationally, we need to make sure that we're highly responsible to the workforce in terms of making them um, uh, as confident as possible that they're um, safe. And that requires real clear um, explanations, uh, understandings and access to resources that, that will provide that confidence that they are working in the safest possible environment. So with that, I will pause. I'll turn my camera back on and I'll answer um, questions uh, if you have any. I understand that you uh, you meet with the secretary on a fairly regular basis and help to speak with him about this guidance. Um, are you able to 
help in delivering the guidance so that it will be more accessible to the field to actually understand I mean, it's complex times, it's complex communication, it's changing a lot, everybody's anxiety is high, just to help with the way the messages are delivered. That obviously, the, the message is important, but the delivery of the message is also important. Do you, do you are you able to provide him feedback? Um, yeah, um, you know, what I would say is, um, and I thought about this over the course of the last week, um, you know, there's, as I've as I said ad nauseum in my testimony, this is extraordinarily challenging and there's nothing perfect about it. Um, Secretary French communicates with individual superintendents on a daily basis with regard to challenges that come up in their systems. Um, he also meets with superintendents uh, every Thursday at two o'clock and sort of runs down what's transpiring. He prefaces those um, meetings by saying that what transpires verbally shouldn't be construed as written guidance um, or shouldn't be construed as the guidance. The guidance will come in written form. And that's because um, the communicators in state government, you know, they're operating in two directions. They're communicating with the field, but there's also a decision making apparatus in state government that they participate in. Um, so I would say to answer your question uh, is a qualified yes, right? So we're able to give the secretary feedback about, um, you know, our impressions and responses to what's happening. Uh, he's got another set of limitations and conditions that he needs to respond to. Um, uh, but 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 I, the answer to your question is yes. The other thing, and I thought about this a lot over the last week too, we're, we have um, now, I think, 117 school districts in Vermont. There are 51 supervisory unions. There's those three independent tech center districts. You know, to the extent that we regard public education as an ecosystem, as it were, every one of those um, districts, and in some instances, schools are ecosystems on their own. So uh, with, you know, different complements of teacher, different socioeconomic and demographics of kids, different socioeconomic and demographics of communities. So, um, so part of the complication is, you know, the, the, the challenge of the pandemic overall, but also how anything plays out in any given community. So I've, you know, I've taken too much time in a long-winded response so yes, we do have an opportunity to provide feedback. I think there are limitations even with that feedback on how decisions get made. Um, and a lot of this plays out community to community, household to household. It's, it's, you know, it's the nature of, I think, what a crisis is. Um, so uh, I've spoken too long on that, but th those are my thoughts on it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm aware of the time. I want to see if there are any questions at this point. 